This is Jonathan Sines, president of Texas Values. Great to be with you on another glorious week in the state of Texas. The war on Christmas has started, sadly, in the state of Texas. I'll have that update for you in just a minute. That just came across our desk yesterday. Our team is on the ground in Taylor, Texas today, working on that issue. I'll have more to say about that. If you're new to the show, we talk about the issues of faith family, and freedom in the arenas of the courts, the legislature, and the media. And just a couple of weeks ago, we crossed over to 300 consecutive episodes of the Texas Values Report. Really excited about that. Or was it 400? I forget. You lose count when you get up to these big numbers. But we have a great guest today. And as a matter of fact, I think this is the first time for him to be on the Texas Values Report. So if you're watching on Facebook Live, share this video, like it, put it in some chats. Let's get those numbers up because we're about to have a great conversation. Our guest today is Chuck DeVore. He serves as the National Initiatives Officer for Texas Public Policy Foundation. Texas Public Policy Foundation is one of the largest, if the, uh, if the largest, likely I believe the largest think tank and public policy organization in the state of Texas. And it's probably one of the biggest state-based organizations and entities of its type across the country. And Mr. DeVore also served in the California State Assembly and has served his country honorably as a reserved in the United States Army. Chuck, welcome to the Texas Values Report. Hey, great to be with you, Jonathan. Well, it's good to spend time with you. We saw each other in person yesterday, and I know we'll see each other from time to time as in a little bit more as we get ready for the state legislature. You can see my clever background behind me. That is the Texas House. Those desks will have people in them very soon. As a matter of fact, I should get an updated version of it because there's a Christmas tree in the Texas House chamber this time of year. As many of us know, those of us that have been around the state legislature and state policy for many years, and that includes yourself. I mean, you and I, I mean, I've been doing work since 2007. I know um, a few years after that, you came along and have been, you know, really one of the leaders at Texas Public Policy Foundation, someone who, I mean, you're often doing national interviews, um, but have really been a voice and a face uh, for that organization. And so, We're excited about that. I'd love for you to tell our listeners and our viewers a little bit about Texas Public Policy Foundation, and then we'll get into some more details about some of your work. Well, thank you, Jonathan. The Texas Public Policy Foundation, like you said, we are the largest of our kind in the country. We have a little over 100 employees. Uh, We really focus on uh, the state of Texas. Obviously, 85, 90 percent of our work is is really Texas-centric. Uh, trying to make Texas a better place to live, trying to keep the taxes lower than they otherwise would be, uh, trying to prevent the proliferation of regulations that often prevent people from starting businesses and supporting their families, uh, and as well doing what we can to promote freedom, uh, both at the state and local level, and of course the federal level. We have a very active public interest law firm now that mostly sues the federal government, but occasionally we sue Texas cities that, that really need it and who have stepped over the line. Uh, and in recent years, uh, as you well know, we've started to get more active in some of the, the cultural and social issues as well, uh, something that uh, we certainly uh, avoided or largely were not engaged in when I first started uh, working for the foundation over 10 years ago. But now, of course, uh, much more frequently uh, because we have to be engaged on these issues, as you well know, uh, given what you do uh, every day of the week. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And my kids are aware of that on Saturday and Sunday sometimes too. As a matter of fact, I was, uh, we were doing some Christmas decorating on Saturday and I had to take a little break and and break away from that, um, to be involved in some of that work. I'll touch on some of that work too later, uh, in the show after we spend our time with Chuck, because there is a breaking update on that, Uh, recent Christmas development out in Taylor, Texas. But, you know, look, it's it's nice, Chuck, that you and I share similar values and interest outside of some of maybe the core policy work that we do, some of the expertise work with your background, whether it's in economics, whether it's uh, looking at different things related to prosperity um, as it when we craft those things or the state legislators do in state policy, your background serving in representative government at the state level, And of course, your background in the military and some in the aerospace industry as well, uh, quite a bit. But for many of us, right, we see some of these issues 
that you're talking about touch on some of these other policy issues. And so um, it's good to see some of the work that you are doing where there are some connection points. I imagine our good friend Kevin Roberts might have had a little bit to do that while he was there as well. And, and so but let's you know, you and I, when we saw each other yesterday, You've got a great book that's come out. I want to talk about that, but then I also want to talk about what, for a few minutes, what we might see at the state legislature and some things related to election integrity. But um, it's good to know our history and where we started from. I was with my daughter last night uh, at the the kitchen counter working on Texas history and, and American Revolution, and you've got this great book that's out, Crisis of the House Never United, a novel about early America in a time period, there you go, in a time period, I've got my version that's signed, in a time period that maybe is not given as much uh, focus and detail. Tell us a little bit about the book and why it was important to you to write it. Yeah, so the idea for this book came to me about 18 years ago. I went through the Claremont Institute's Lincoln Fellowship Program, which is a pretty intense eight-day seminar uh, where you learn about the principles of the founding of the nation and how those came to be realized over time, uh, especially during the great civil war, uh, the advent of progressivism, and of course, modern day. And what I found out was, uh, as you alluded to, during this uh, time of history that there's not a lot of uh, focus on, which is that time of history between uh, the victory in the Revolutionary War over the British and the, uh, the ratification of the Constitution. Uh, and of course, during that period of time, we were governed by the Articles of Confederation, uh, which were a fairly weak system of central governance. Uh, and it led to um, some, some significant unrest, uh, the, the, the most notable of which was Shays' Rebellion in Massachusetts, uh, where you had farmers who owed a lot of money, both uh, for uh, mortgages because they put more acres under the plow uh, to help feed the country when General Cornwallis of the British was in the South, you know, putting Southern farms to the torch. And of course, uh, to help pay taxes after winning the war because uh, the government of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth there, had borrowed a lot to be able to help support the war effort. And so these farmers were expected to pay their debts in hard currency and gold and silver, which was pretty scarce. Uh, not in continental dollars, which had been, uh, pro, you know, just printed uh, like they were going out of style, kind of reminds you about certain things today, perhaps. So right. those had inflated to the point where they weren't worth much and the government wouldn't even take them as payment. So the farmers were pretty frustrated and they revolted. And that uh, episode, catalyst that led to the ratification of the Constitution. But one of the things I found out when I went through this Lincoln Fellowship back in 2004 was even with that, the ratification of the Constitution was a very nearly run thing. It almost didn't happen, which then got me to thinking, gee, what would have happened if we didn't ratify the Constitution? And so rather than make it, uh, Jonathan, some sort of like a dry history book, you know, what if, I turned it into a novel, a historical novel. And so uh, basically I, I, I take it out from uh, the, the opening scenes with the Battle of Monmouth in 1778, uh, to about 1804, uh, and things uh, things don't work out all that well for the country. There's a lot of strife and a lot of contention uh, because we we didn't have the Constitution in my alternate history. Well, and look, whether it's you know the way that you present it through a novel, the way you know it, it played out during that time in people's individual lives. These, these is a, this is a real time period, right, that we went through in our country that I think, you know, you're, you're, we're 200 and plus years away from that. So people can sort of be detached and forget about that, particularly in Texas. We have a lot of history, but not what you see up in the Northeast, right, to where you can see some of those old buildings and feel them and touch them. And it might feel a little bit more real. A lot of the history we probably talk about in Texas relates to Texas as a republic and some of its struggles before coming to that point. Uh, but there's so many fascinating things. I, I would love to learn more about them to myself. I'm looking forward to getting deep into reading this book. Um, got it from you yesterday. You were very kind to sign it. And, you know, and, and I'm not kidding, right? Yesterday I was working with my daughter um, on Texas uh, history, but they were also talking about some connections with the American Revolution. So I got a, a question for you. I'm going to put you on the spot because yeah. I didn't know the answer to this. Do you know what the word parley means? Have you heard that term? Well, sure. I mean, to parley is to uh, is to negotiate or discuss with somebody. Yeah. Uh, probably a truce. The word Maybe to from. try to come to a truce. 
Yeah. I did not. I never heard this word before. And I'm not I'm not as deep into this as you are, but I feel like I know a lot about history and law and policy. And here's my daughter in seventh grade. I'm like, I've never heard that word. That's Let's great. Check so we learned something together about American history. Let's talk a little bit about the legislative session. I know there's a lot of talk about election integrity. Um, we have a new secretary of state soon. John Scott is leaving that position and Senator Jane Nelson is coming into that position. But I know that's an issue. We just finished a very active election season, but I know that's an issue that you've been involved in and care about. And I know there's probably still some things on people's mind going into this session that they might be looking towards. Tell us um, how you're seeing that issue size up as we get close to January 10th, the start of the uh, 2023 legislative session in Texas. Yeah, well, I think it's important for people to understand that Texas has really been putting a lot of effort into trying to close some of these loopholes that you see in other states that allow people to really game the system. And I think it's very notable that the two most populous states, California, where I used to be a lawmaker, and Texas, literally exchange the, the rules on mail-in ballots and uh, what we call uh, ballot trafficking. Uh, I think the more benign term is ballot harvesting, but it's really ballot trafficking if you look at how it's done and the money that's exchanged. Uh, Jonathan, in 2016 and 17, uh, the, the two most populous states exchanged their rules on this. What we did in Texas is we made it so that you can't get paid to go harvest or traffic in ballots. Uh, you can't be paid by the ballot. You can't be paid at all. You can't be given any sort of political consideration. And you have to be a relative, a close relative of the person whose ballot you're handling or have power of attorney. Uh, and, and what had happened was California used to have those rules in 2016. And they adopted Texas's old rules and Texas adopted California's old rules. Uh, and what you saw then in the 2018 cycle in California was people would go door to door. You'd have union uh, members like from the SEIU union going door to door, uh, asking young people who had never before voted to vote by mail. And then they would get control of their ballot and they would vote on their behalf, uh, helping them, helping them, air quotes, right? violating the secrecy of the ballot in order to vote on behalf of that person. Uh, and obviously that is uh, something that uh, should be uh, prevented or avoided at all costs. Lastly, we are very concerned at the foundation with the recent criminal court of appeals ruling in, uh, I think just about a year ago, that stripped our attorney general of the power to uh, go after people who commit election fraud uh, criminally. Uh, the, that power is no longer resident with our attorney general. So it's up to local uh, county uh, district attorneys to uh, police election fraud. And we believe uh, that this is uh, something that may over time result in uh, people not uh, facing the consequences for engaging in election fraud. And so certainly that's a weakness that needs to be addressed through a, a statutory change. And I appreciate that description. Y'all might have seen I dropped for just a second. I apologize. Chuck did a great job of continuing the conversation as uh, as I had a little issue with the technology on my end. Um, you know, it's interesting, too. Um, I'm curious about this, Chuck. Um, well, I should say the Honorable Mr. DeVore. I forgot to use all of your title <laughs> in your time in elective office. It's funny. I'll see members of the legislature from time to time. And, you know, maybe they were a chairman of a committee recently or, you know, when they left. And I'm like still calling them Mr. Chairman and so on. Anyway, fun stuff we do at the Capitol. But, Chuck, I'm curious. You do a lot of national interviews, but you're from California. Now you've been in Texas for a while. Um, do you get feedback from time to time from folks on you know, from the national level, sort of what their impression is of Texas and what's going on? Because I've lived in Texas all my life, fifth generation. I don't leave the state all that often. And sometimes I can be very Texas centric. You ever get feedback from from national folks? Because I find sometimes it can be different than maybe how we see things in our own state. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's important to understand that uh, there's a lot of competition going on. Uh, you have people borrowing each other's ideas, modifying them, trying them out. Nothing stays the same forever. And so in the case of Texas, uh, you know, you have to work hard at being a place that attracts young families to come and, and move to your state and to uh, begin the process of growing their family and, 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 you know, putting a good roof over their heads and maybe starting a business. 
Uh, all of this stuff, if, if you just keep the, the things the way they are, government has a tendency to grow and to become more powerful and more intrusive. Uh, you certainly see that in Texas at the local level. Uh, you certainly see that with our property taxes that continue to go up faster than they should. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, you see from other people around the country, both an appreciation for Texas, but as well some friendly competition that, hey, you know, Texas, we can do it. Maybe we can do it better. You see that a lot, of course, out of Florida right now with Governor DeSantis. And so I think it's very important for Texans who are engaged in their government, whether they're serving in that capacity as an elected official, whether they're a staffer or whether they're an activist, to understand that Texas is a pretty special place, but you have to work hard to keep it that way. Okay, so I'm going to put you on the spot on this. Do you have some friends and family in California that are envious that you made it out of California and you're pretty settled in Texas? Yeah, I actually not have to pick quite on your former state too much. Yeah, yeah, there are quite a few people who uh, contact me or who keep in touch with me who wish they could get out, but they have family there, uh, you know, grandkids or something, or maybe they, uh, you know, the, it's just not financially feasible for them to do it right now. Uh, but yes, there are <laughs> there are count, countless people. What is even more common, Jonathan, is I will be contacted by people who tell me uh, very that they've moved to Texas and that they're very thankful that they were able to get out of California and come to Texas and, and become Texans. So uh, that's even more common. Uh, well, I have all business. Yes, go ahead. I got two job openings. If they're interested, I've got a, a public policy position. We're trying to hire for this next session to add to our team, a grassroots coordinator. So if you've got somebody that's interested, you send them my way. So real quick before we, um, before we uh, let you go here, y'all have got a big event coming up. Texas Public, Public Policy Foundation has their annual policy orientation coming up. Probably one of the biggest events of its type. We continue to try to borrow ideas from y'all for the event we usually do in the fall. Tell us a little bit about that event and uh, you know maybe some of the highlights that y'all see sure. coming into it. Well, it's a three-day event. Uh, we've rebranded it now, Policy Summit. It's going to be March first, second, and third. And of course, the second is Texas Independence Day. So it's a big deal, right? We'll probably have the reading of the Texas Declaration of Independence and, and some acknowledgement, of course, of, of that great event. Uh, generally, what you see is a series of panels and uh, keynote speakers, uh, people of some prominence speaking for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then a series typically of three or four concurrent panels. And so you have to really pay attention to the schedule so that you uh, uh, don't miss one that you really like. Although, of course, we, we record them all and they're all uh, you know, uh, archived so that if you miss it, you can get it later. But typically what we do, Jonathan, is we very carefully um, craft the panels to sync up with our legislative uh, year. So, for example, you'll see something about parental empowerment, or I've got a panel that I'm leading on election integrity and, and what are the things we need to look out for in the 2024 election cycle. Uh, so it, it's a, a pretty jam-packed uh, three days and uh, pretty fun for people who are into that sort of thing, uh, you know, policy nerds and, and political uh, wonks. I prefer uh, the word expert over yeah, nerd. Yeah, yeah. Word no. nerd, and look Jonathan. It, trust me, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> look, but, you know, I always enjoy it. And, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that. So it's in March this year. I didn't see that. I'm glad I brought it up because we're so used to it always being in yes. January. So I'm glad you mentioned that uh, the first week of March, but no difference in the importance of it. Uh, and certainly, you know, tying in with Texas Independence Day, I always think it's a good idea. Chuck, I really appreciate all the work that you're doing at Texas Public Policy Foundation and all the great people over there. For many years, our office was across the street from y'all on the other side of Congress. Uh, we ended up moving one block up. We're now at 10th in Congress. We're still pretty close to you guys, just a block over. And so I'm always, you know, just seeing great work and just thinking, you know, that you're setting a great standard for so many people, but creating opportunities for young people and, and, and people at any age to get involved in different ways, but obviously having an influence on the state of Texas and providing such great value for the things that we care about. So uh, I appreciate all that you're doing there, and I hope to have you back sometime. And it's been a real blessing today to have Chuck DeVore on the Texas Values Report. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you. 
All right, I got just a few minutes left, and I'm going to let Chuck go. But, um, boy, I'm going to book him again because, you know, anytime you've got former elected officials and experts in their field, uh, they really know their stuff. And uh, and I want to maybe get a little bit more into his book, too, um, because I think any way that you can sort of take the history and then engage young people and uh, or, or people of any age to talk about these things and see, you know, how things could might have ended up a different way. I just think it's very thought provoking because sometimes now it feels that way. Are we going to go this way or that way on some of our issues? And it really important for people to know um, how, you know, how one decision or two could make a difference in the trajectory of a country. Speaking of the Constitution, there is a huge battle going on, and this is happening today. If you're listening or watching this on Thursday, okay, we're I'm live on Facebook if you're watching right now. Um, and the city of Taylor is having a city council meeting today. All right. Our team is going to be there on the ground. We've already done some analysis. They are banning Christians from Christmas parades. OK, you can't make this stuff up. This is the first battle in the war, the evidence of the war on Christmas in Texas this year. Sadly, it's out of Taylor, Texas, and it relates to a Christmas parade. Um, we sent an alert out. Yesterday was late in the day because we were starting to get uh, some information about this issue. So we were in packet. We were doing legal analysis, policy analysis. And there it is right there somewhere between page 267 and 270. The city makes it clear that one of the things that would disqualify you from participating in certain special events, which includes parades in uh, the city of Taylor, is if you uh, your particular religion. And so that's, you know, what Christians are, okay? We're part of a, a religious belief and uh, biblical beliefs. And so there it is right there. If you're if you're a part of that, you cannot be participating in these events. But look, this is no coincidence, okay? There has been a little battle that's been brewing for several weeks where the city of Taylor had two different Christmas parades because the group that had been doing it for quite a long time is a church-based Christian group, um, has certain standards and there's been people that have been trying to infiltrate it or, you know, bring their views there. And what we're hearing is they there was some people that wanted to have drag queen performers and all kinds of inappropriate stuff. And that is obviously not a Christian value. It doesn't follow what the Bible says on these type of issues. And so whatever the case may be, this particular Christian group, they did have a sponsorship or some type of agreement with the city. The city withdrew that sponsorship and then ended up having this LGBT group and some other groups and drag queen performers in the city parade. So the drag queens were able to be a part of the city parade. The Christians got booted out. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. And it's just it's unbelievable. But so now, but what happened with this last weekend, the city of Taylor allowed the Christian and church group to have a parade, even though they got uh, stripped of, you know, whatever uh, that amounts to is, is being a part of this uh, city parade that usually happens. They had their own parade, but apparently that wasn't enough because I, I think we started hearing Monday or late sometime Tuesday, they're now going to come up with a new policy on how they decide things. Cause they were getting a lot of grief from, I guess, their friends and the, you know, the, the group of folks that, and we're engaging for what I could see efforts to keep this other parade from happening. Um, and all of this is based on, I mean, look, this is all revolves around our biblical beliefs and the fact that uh, Christmas and Christianity is about Jesus and what the Bible says on issues of sexuality. So now the city is coming up with this new policy that singles out and targets people of religious faith, which includes Christians. Not only that, but if you're a nonprofit and Christian organization, you can't be involved in it if you're just a church. Your church has to have a 501c3 letter from the, the uh, IRS, which is not required to be a church in the state of Texas. You don't have to go through that process to be a nonprofit. In addition to that, you have to adopt an LGBT sexual orientation and gender identity policy as a part of your organization in order to participate in a city event. This is not even required in state law. And so it's very clear that the city is taking sides on political issues. And as a result of that, they're targeting Christians and singling out people of religious faith and banning them from being able to participate in these events that are city sponsored. 
events. And so it's very clear this issue is unconstitutional. But if we don't stand up and do something, um, you're likely to see this pass. I think they probably were trying to rush this through. The city council meetings tonight at six. We did an alert yesterday. Um, we're letting all of our folks know, particularly in that Taylor area, you have got to show up to these meetings. We say it all the time. Government belongs to those who show up. If people don't show up and, and express their uh, opposition to this, it will give the impression that it's probably not that big of a deal. And it is a big deal. Because now you see these, these drag queen issues now impacting not only the public library and your public school, now they're impacting Christmas parades. I mean, it just... You know, it, it's um, it's very concerning, but it is a clear violation, first of all. But that's not, you know, it's not only enough sometimes to just identify that it's a violation of law. If no one holds them accountable or does something about it or goes to the city council meeting and testifies against it, uh, it'll give the impression that there's not a, an issue. And there certainly is. That's why our team is going to be there testifying. We're going to have a press conference later on this issue at five o'clock. We're sending a press release out right now. We sent an alert out last night and today. Help us keep Christ in Christmas. Help us save Christmas by being a part of this if you're in or close to the Taylor area and consider supporting us financially. We did not see this coming up so quickly, even though we we work on protecting Christmas every year. You never know when it's going to come up and you got to react. So please consider donating to us. We also have a reception tomorrow in the Austin area at Maggiano's 1130 to 1. Abby Johnson and female college athlete Riley Gaines are going to be at our Christmas reception and legislative preview in Houston on December 12th. Great events there. Go to our website, txvalues.org. Check our social media sites to find out all the work we're doing to protect Christmas, pro-life, and so many issues. And that's how together you'll help us protect faith, family, and freedom in Texas. And we'll talk to you next week on the Texas Values Report.